Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of A Handful of Hope. I'm so happy and grateful to have Leah Guy with us here today, who's an intuitive spiritual teacher, mindfulness expert, and author of three books, including her new release, Overcoming Toxic Emotions, a practical guide to building better relationships with yourself and others. She uses her personal triumphs over abuse, addiction, and anxiety, along with more than two decades experience in private practice to help people access their fullest potential. A sought after inspirational speaker, Leah has appeared on top media outlets as an expert of the mind body connection, energy medicine, and emotional and spiritual healing. She facilitates retreats and workshops around the country and internationally online. He has a BA from the University of Louisville, a CMT from the Live and Well Institute of Conscious Bodywork, and studied at the School of Enlightenment and Healing. Leah, welcome and thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Good to be here. I read Overcoming Toxic Emotions, and I think it is such a wonderful book for us to have as a nightstand tool during mm -hmm. this time as we're kind of coming out of the pandemic and everything. And what I appreciated most about this Lee, is you offer, you use your own journey in many parts to reflect on, but you offer a lot of simple exercises to do along with just really understanding and, and digesting to be able to digest down some of the psychology and the emotions and why we do what we do. And much of this is based around your AAA method. And I might, thought we might start there. What is the AAA method and how does that look like in just steps for people so they can start breaking it down and considering it for themselves? Yeah. Well, I don't want to give the whole book away. <laughs> yeah, but... yeah. We're not giving the whole book away. People are going to need to read the book. <laughs> Um, the AAA method is a system that, you know, I developed just in working with clients and, and with myself over many years, because I find that people get overwhelmed so quickly, especially in our healing work. You know, they don't know where to start. They don't know where to go. They should do this. They should see this person. They should try this therapy. They should, you know, meditate this amount of time. Like there's just so much, so many things that are possible and they get overwhelmed. And so on a very personal and, um, you know, present kind of um, approach to healing, I think we have to have some kind of system within ourselves so that we can rely on. Like when I get overwhelmed, when I feel lost, when I feel anxious, when I feel whatever I feel, even if I feel something I felt 15 years ago, what can I do in this moment? And so the, there's three simple steps, um, acknowledge, uh, accept, and uh, action. And they sound very simple and they are, but they're not always so easy to do in our lives. But I give a lot of examples throughout the book of, um, you know, how to actually move into each of these parts of ourselves that can, you know, what does acknowledgement really mean? Well, there's the superficial kind of acknowledgement of something, and then there's a deeper inner sense of knowingness and, you know, awareness and seeing in a deeper way what's going on. And so when we get into true acknowledgement of our own behaviors, of our own patterns of our own feelings, then we have, then we're grounded in it, we're connected to it. And then we have the power to do something about it rather than being separate from it, looking at it, blaming other people, questioning it, continuing to have negative self-talk or, you know, just feel this is the way I am or whatever it is. We have to really um, connect to the thing that is troubling us. So that's why I set up the system and I am a big action taker, but it's not just about taking action in the sense of action itself. Even mental thought can be action, you know, even um, learning how to shift our emotional center and, and come back to a certain place. That's an action. You know, breath work is action. There's a lot of very simple, small things that we can do. It all doesn't have to be, you know, let's not just distract ourselves and take an action that, you know, gets us out of this mood or out of this mode, but what are we, what are we doing? What are we, what are we being in this moment? And an mm. action to help us become our being is the place of our centeredness. And so the book is filled, as you said, with a lot of different, um, stories, but also uh, hopefully a lot of different helpful tools of how to continually bring us back home and bring us back to this place where we have empowerment to feel differently. You mentioned two key words there that I hope we can expand on for just a minute, blaming and acknowledging. And I think sometimes people get the two confused and you gave this beautiful example in your book about, and I'm paraphrasing here, but oftentimes people will struggle with acknowledging the roles their parents played in the things they did or did not do in their development. And that it's important for us to recognize acknowledging is not blaming. We're not blaming them for circumstances, but we are acknowledging 
their, their shortcomings or their inabilities or their failures. Can you speak to that just a little bit? Because I think a lot of people get stuck with this. It's like they withhold yeah. acknowledging the role someone else did, or they'll immediately default to blaming. Yes. That's a great question. And I appreciate you asking it because I would say most every client that I work with in our first or second and sometimes third session, we, we get into the habit of the blaming, even if we can, you know, if someone can tell you what happened, let's say what happened in their family dynamic or what someone did, um, you know, in, in that situation, when we're blaming someone, we're putting our energy and our focus on them and making them be responsible for the way that we feel now. And if we do that, and if we continue to do that, we never have full ownership of how we feel now because it's always attached to the ownership of the person who did it, to the blamer. When we acknowledge something, we acknowledge that this happened. And in fact, so many of my clients, this is what I started to say, get into protective mode with their parents in particular of, you know, well, they did the best they could, or, you know, they, someone was limited or someone had a mental health issue or someone had addiction or, you know, we were poor or we had no support or whatever, you know, like that we get into this excuse making essentially, because we don't want to feel bad about being disloyal to our parents. Right. That's not what I'm suggesting when I'm saying, acknowledging what happened until we are so honest with ourselves of, okay, let's, let's just go ahead and say, everyone's doing the best they can, even if it doesn't seem like the best to us, you know, everyone's doing the best they can. Let's just put that out there. If we get into the acknowledgement of this is what happened actually happened. And this is the way I feel as a result of that. Then we're in a place of not putting our energy and focus on the person and why it happened or what happened. Then we're in the focus of okay, this is mine and I have to deal with this. And I acknowledge that it came because of that, but that is no longer present. And what is still present is my rage or my defensiveness or my shame or my guilt. It's all about our ownership. In fact, I don't know if it's the first or second line of the book, you know, and the introductions about this is a book about breaking up with blame, because as long as we're attached to the blame of whatever happened, whether it was in your childhood or in adulthood or what have you, a lot of people are in relationships and, you know, they blame I'm with a narcissistic husband, or I have a, this person's doing this to me until we can look at what our role is in this situation or relationship, you know, why we're putting up with it, why we attracted that, why we're still here. Why, you know, what are we doing? How, how are we feeling? What are we, um, you know, how are we exchanging in this relationship? then we're constantly giving power to the other person. We're basically leaving our sense of self and putting all of our um, emotional experience and, and our wellness into the hands of other people. So that's kind of the difference. And it is a very important difference um, to be able to acknowledge the truth without blaming because that serves nothing and acknowledge the truth of what happened and acknowledge the truth of how that experience or relationship or situation uh, rendered you, you know, how yeah. are you right now? Because we can't go back. I can't, you know, we can't look at how you were a month ago because we're not a month ago. We can't look at how you were when you were a child because you're not a child. We can look at the inner child, which is another chapter in the book. But we have to attend to what is going on right now. And then that opens up a whole chapter of content and information about, you know, what is true? What, where is this negative beliefs coming from? Where are these false beliefs coming from? Where is this negative talk coming from? Where is the shame coming from? Where is this guilt coming from? And if we're, if we're really talking about what's going on right now, then we can explore in such a deeper way of the attachments that we have to our stories, to our pain, to our past, and to certain beliefs that, you know, kind of help identify us. It's terrifying for a lot of people to make positive change. You know, it's terrifying to release that storyline, the narrative that's connected to that who I am as associated with these people or this circumstance or this place or what have you. So, you know, we, we need to be very kind to ourselves when we're doing our healing work. You know, something I appreciate so much the discussion of blaming is I think that there's there's such great 
exploration on it in the book. And it's so relevant in so many ways, not just personal journeys, but many of the journeys we've been on this last year. I, I can't tell you how many people that I've talked to in the last year who have expressed a, you know, what's the polite way of saying it, a dissatisfaction with their social feeds or their conversations with family members. And, and so much of that is there's a lot of blaming going on about what's happening in the world. It's this person's fault, it's this person's fault, or even how we're approaching one another societally. And it's, it's a fascinating thing because my impression of it, that is, is as long as we're blaming, we can't change, right? Mm -hmm. It's just, it's like, oh, here's my power here. I, I'm giving it to you. Leah. You walk right. away, you take my power with me. And then I'll just keep, and because I feel powerless, then I'm probably going to be more defensive and, and lash out more to try to push away. Right. That's exactly what happens. I mean, you know, this, the energy exchange that we have a lot of people in their suffering or in feeling stuck or feeling harboring resentments. And so, you know, there's a powerlessness that's going on behind that. And again, it's no one's fault, you know, but we have to recognize and acknowledge, I feel powerless right now. That's why I feel scared. That's why I feel uh, angry. That's why I feel defensive. I feel powerless. And unfortunately, perhaps we haven't learned how to be powerful or in our power, but that mm. is the work of the adult conscious self. You know, the inner child part of us wants to say, I'm powerless. I need help. I need to be saved. I need you to, you know, fix this. I need to make sure I'm fed and nurtured and survived and all this kind of stuff. And the inner child is terrified because it, feels powerless and children often are powerless, but we bring that belief and that mentality, what I call in the book, our emotional imprint, we bring that forward. And that often starts running our show. We have to separate and come into our adult conscious self. This is what intentional mindful living is about. Who's showing up right now? Is this my adult self showing up? Is this my inner child showing up? Is this uh, somebody else's thoughts and beliefs showing up? And if I'm not in my adult conscious self, then I'm probably going to be reactive. You know, I'm going to blame, mm. I'm going to be defensive. I'm going to react. I'm going to get triggered. I'm going to whatever. When we're in our adult conscious self, if we've done any amount of uh, healing work or awareness work, or just, you know, kind of self growth maturation work, then we can recognize the difference between a mature conversation the ability to listen, we can step into our empathy, we can, you know, apply compassion, we can be gentle with ourselves, we can set healthy boundaries, we can practice all of these wonderful things in our adult conscious self. But if we're not there, then we're somewhere else. And that's our job to figure out where are we. And that's no one else's problem. You know, it was someone else's problem when we were five. You know, are we running? Are we lost in the grocery store? You know, are we abandoned in our bedroom, like that's someone else's problem when we're five, but we're not five. So it's our problem now. And I love that you made that distinction about, it's not about fault. It's not about fault finding. I think we, it seems like we get so caught up in finding fault or right and wrong versus really seeking what is true for us, true for mm. us, independent of fault or blame or right or wrong, but just really is true. And it's the experiential piece of it, right? This happened. And I felt but it's not that there's a fault in it. And it's like, that seems like almost where you get hit up, we get hung up with it. And I know you mentioned in the book that we can get addicted to a, We can get addicted to our pain. And when you talk about pain in the book specifically, you're not talking necessarily about physical pain, please correct me if I'm wrong, but you're talking about the emotional pain. Right. But we can, we can find these patterns where we become, we become so addicted to our emotional pain. And then I'm, I'm paraphrasing using my words here, but it's very much the same as, as, it seems like an addict that is using drugs would go and seek out drugs. We go and seek out that emotional pain. Why do we do that? Well, a lot of people have this perception that we're doing it to seek pleasure, but when we seek out drugs, we're seeking out, a, um, we're seeking out more pain. So that addiction to pain is connected to our emotional imprint of pain. And this is why in the book, I talk about vibrational frequencies, you know, not to get to woo woo about all that because it doesn't need that, but there does need to be an understanding of our energetic and emotional state, right? Cause we always are in a state. And so if we're in a state when we're young of being terrified or afraid or feeling abandoned or feeling unloved or feeling bad about ourselves, feeling neglected, feeling overly, you know, um, uh, uh, enmeshed with others, you know, if we, if we don't have the, the space 
as a young person to feel safe and healthily nurtured and learn who we are and develop that sense of self agency, then we're going to, you know, uh, we're going to, well, for lack of a better word, we're going to feel bad, right? So if we're feeling bad, we know everyone knows what it means to feel bad. Now imagine that this young child feels bad a lot. That becomes its state of reality. The child yeah. doesn't have the skills to process whatever is necessary to get itself out of feeling bad aside from learning, oh, if I do this, mom will react to me differently. Or maybe I can get some relief if I go outside and play with the worms for a few minutes, you know, or if I, you know, tell this little white lie and, you know, be a little bit manipulative, then I get my needs met too. Or if I don't behave like this, then that person's happier. So we learn these kinds of skills to, to operate from so that we feel less bad, but primarily so that we survive, you know, that's what a child wants to do is survive and be loved. Now, if we had that experience of not feeling good, feeling bad, we don't just walk out of our house one day and go, oh, I know how to feel good. You know, we may go, oh, this feels good or this feels different. But because we have these, what I call the emotional energetic imprints, it's like we, our sense of self is enveloped in this shroud of a frequency of a belief system. And so we can go out and feel good, but we're not going to feel like us. We're not going to feel the same. It's going to feel uncomfortable, even though it's good, it's going to feel uncomfortable. And there's just like an addiction, we get kind of magnetized back to the thing that makes us feel comfortable because it's what we know. It's just what we know. You know, and we're, if we're not judging it as that's bad or that's good or whatever, it's just what someone knows. So right. this addiction to pain becomes like an addiction to the cycle of our comfort, of our beingness, of our reality. And again, until we consciously try to break that cycle and learn how to satisfy our own needs that weren't met, to learn how to um, find that sense of self and the sense of trust and self-agency until we learn how to... Um, you know, become a, a person that we can rely on and that we can love and nurture ourselves and our inner child, we're going to always be addicted and attracted back to that feeling. I often tell people, and maybe I told the story in the book, I don't even remember, but you know, when I was young from the outside world, everything looked normal and perfect and whatever. And without getting, you know, too personal about my family or my situation, but I had often a feeling of loneliness, you know, and I would, um, often be in my room by myself. I wasn't happy, but I felt safe there, you know, and I create this little environment, this microcosm of experiences and, you know, friends and plants and music and whatever that made me feel okay, you know, but I did, I wasn't okay. I didn't feel the way I wanted to feel, you know, and it felt bad. So guess what? As I grow up, I find other situations that feel the same way that I felt then, because mm. that's what I knew. That's what I know. It's not that I want to feel that way. It's that my entire being, unless I'm applying really conscious effort is going to seek and attract that because that's the frequency I'm living in. That's the frequency of who I am. Does that make sense? Yeah. Gosh, it makes so much sense. It's just, it's like we, what isn't there some law law of familiarity or where right. we, we gravitate towards what's familiar right right and even if we know I, I have yet to talk to anybody who's ever struggled with any sort of substance that will say oh yeah it's it's wonderful i love being addicted right. to this right yet they still gravitate to it. and in us on the outside we go well i don't understand if you know it's bad why do you keep doing it mm -hmm. right because it's, it's feeding their pain it's yeah it's yeah. a recognition of that familiar feeling I want to talk a little bit about acceptable versus authentic. There's, I think this is such an important piece right now. And so I'll give a lead into it. I remember one time I was asked, you know, why are, why do people have such a hard time in romantic relationships? And I gave the hypothetical scenario. I said, well, imagine the boy meets girl, but what happens is, is boys thinking, you know, how do I need to show up for a girl so she'll like me? And girls thinking, how do I need to show up for boys so he, she likes me? And so what ends up happening is we don't, actually go on a date what we do is we send our best representative the representative we think we need to send to represent us on the date 
And so then the relationship is built on these two representatives, not actually ourself. And all of a sudden, once time goes on and we are able to relax into ourself, we wake up and we realize, we, I don't really know this person. I, I like the example. I like how you break down authentic self versus acceptable self. And, I, and the reason I'm bringing this up, and I think it's so relevant now, is so many of us are working from home. And I've heard so many people celebrate the fact, you know, working from home, I, I don't have to get dressed up. I'm in my comfortable clothes. I, you know, it's, it's, what is it? Business on top, casual on the bottom, those types of things. And there's this, at least what I've been hearing is there's this kind of almost trepidation about going back to work as it was, because is it going to pull us out of where it might be more authentic? Do we really like to get dressed up? Do we really like to have to show up to and conform to those societal norms? So I was hoping you could speak a little bit about that, the authentic self and the acceptable self. And maybe how do we, how do we navigate those in a way that gives us a sense of, of peace and health and calm? Mm, that's a good question. I think about this so much, especially during the pandemic, but you know, why we're doing what we're doing, you know, we put on this facade that we've all agreed to let me, let me put this makeup on, let me put these certain clothes on, let me put these shoes on and I'll show up this way. And it's agreeable to everyone and acceptable to everyone. And there's been, as we all know, you know, the artist friend or the, the, you know, the retired person that quit caring or, you know, the the eclectic type that has kind of always rebelled against that and and said, screw it. I, you know, this is who I am. And we all respect those people. Although, you know, we look at them out of the corner of our eye, but there's a longing to be like them, you know, inside of ourselves, because how can you not respect someone who's just fully being themselves? So I think, you know, um, I, I'm hopeful just to speak to the pandemic part. I'm hopeful that as we reemerge, that we bring with us and question why we're doing what we're doing a little bit deeper, you know, and that we can feel more confident in ourselves, um, showing up with our gifts instead of that facade showing up with our, um, what we have to offer the world instead of what we're trying to impress pe upon people. I hope that we can bring some of that with us out of this and whether that's, you know, fashion statements or whether that's just the way we relate to each other. Um, that's what I really hope. And, and I think that that could be a really positive change. You know, I think it's interesting about the authentic self. It's so hard for a lot of people to feel fully themselves because obviously, you know, we don't want to be judged. We feel like we're going to, um, it's ultimately a sense of I'm not good enough to be who I am. So I have to do something different so that you accept and approve of me, because if not, then I'm going to be here alone and I will be abandoned and forever rejected from humanity. And that's a really hardcore sense of shame. You know, so many people don't want to say, I feel ashamed of myself, or I don't feel like I have shame or I don't to me in the work that I do, I would say is the number one issue that is that is in front of most every person at different mm. levels, at different really? levels. We all know it. It is. And it's, and it beca can become very toxic to people, but whenever we self doubt, whenever we hide, whenever we, you know, do this false representation, whenever we, you know, try to be something else that we're not, we're essentially putting ourselves on the back burner and we're, you know, creating this mask or the, this, you know, false persona or whatever to come forward in attempts to protect us from being rejected. And the only reason we would do that is because we don't feel like we'll be accepted. Hmm. So if we accept ourselves fully, if I accept myself fully, of course, the way I talk to you right now is a little bit different than the way I'm going to talk to my girlfriend in an hour, you know? It's a little because there's familiarity, there's comfort, there's vulnerability, there's, you know, certain things that we that we do develop in different relationships. I'm not saying we need to bring all of that to, you know, our business ventures and to, you know, online social media or whatever. However, if I'm if I'm showing up as a completely different person, then I'm out of integrity with myself and I can't accept myself when I'm out of integrity. So, for example, you know, it, whatever your advice is or your bad habit is, everyone has them, you know, all of us have them. If, if we can't accept that part of ourselves, then we're essentially being hypocrites, you know, to we're continuing that cycle of self-sabotage. If we can do the thing and fully accept it, 
then not only are we not being hypocrites, we don't have the energy of self-sabotage, but we're also relaxing the energy of our, um, you know, self-love and grace and um, authenticity to humanity, to just allowing ourselves to be human. And when we can't allow ourselves to be human, guess what? Goes back to shame. Hmm. I should be something better. Being human isn't enough. Just being me isn't okay. The shame, shame is about, it's not that you've done something wrong. It's there's something wrong with you. So anytime we feel like we can't accept ourselves or we can't accept someone else, often when we can't accept someone else, it's a sign that we're not accepting something within ourselves. But if we can't accept ourselves, then we're coming from a place of shame. If we can be fully authentic in our own space and environment, you know, whatever that, whatever that means, being fully authentic and accepting that, that part of us and being vulnerable enough to share that at least with ourselves, but hopefully with other people as well, then we really step into empowering the sense of self and self agency. This is me. I am, you know, I am, and it's not just, you have to accept me because, you know, this is just the way I am. That's a defense mechanism. You know, that's not what we're talking about here. The I am is just the beingness. It's the, the awareness and recognition and acceptance of I am soul in this human body who struggles and suffers and experiences so much. I sometimes can't even fathom it all, right? But I still am and I'm worth being here. Hmm. And, you know, the, the other is, um, you know, condoning negative behaviors, which is something you know, that defensive defensiveness, especially in relationship, somebody will do something and go, that's just the way I am. No, it's not. You know, that's a learned behavior to protect yourself from something or another. And you have the ability to question it, be curious, shift it, change it, you know, uh, massage it, what have you. That's not the way that you are. However, two people in relationship that are in the struggle of not accepting one another or bringing forward the other person's lack, that's not their job either. You know, can you be with someone in full acceptance, seeing their humanity, offering grace, offering compassion, having empathy for the other person, seeing their internal struggles? Can you be there, accept that and not try to change them? Your mm -hmm. love and presence and essence and beingness and your sense of uh, acceptance of self is enough to be present to another person to encourage and to support their own growth and maturation so that they can come to their own place of acceptance and grace and compassion. That's powerful. Lee, I know I want to be respectful of your time and we're going to run up on time here. So before I ask my final question, where can people find and connect with you online? Uh, my website is leahguy.com. I also um, have a new podcast myself called the Modern Sage Podcast. And social media is at Leah Guy Live. Perfect. And we'll make sure all the links and everything are up there too. There are a lot of exercises and insights and tools that you can use in overcoming toxic emotions. And one of them that really stood out to me was the, the heart opening exercise. And I thought, Leah, if you would be open to it, maybe we could end and you could just give us a glimpse of that and run us, run us through an example of it. Because I think it, what it stood out to me the most is it's something that we could all do wherever we are. And it takes seconds, maybe even a couple minutes to do, but it's, it's something that allows us to really go in within and connect to ourselves. Sure. But you're going to have to remind me which heart opening exercise because oh. I have, I have two new books and I have four different platforms. So, yes, and, and I teach meditation all the time. So please remind me. Yes. It's uh, page 144. Put your right hand over your heart, place your left ah. hand over your right hand, three deep breaths. Gotcha. Okay. I won't open the book. Let's do it together. So go ahead and close your eyes and take a deep breath. Bring your mouth together and just let the breath flow in and out of your nose very simply. On your next inhale, follow the breath in through your nose and let it reach the heart space. Just notice your chest rise and fall. On your next inhale, take your right hand and place it right between your breast and the center of your chest plate. And then take your left hand and place it right over your right hand. 
Without pushing too hard, make sure that your hand feels your body underneath the pads of your fingers, and the palm of your hand, and that your left hand is connected fully to your right hand, and maybe your fingertips are feeling your chest as well. Try to relax here and just notice on your next in-breath if you can apply a very simple message. I love myself. I love you. Take another deep, long inhale and exhale. And when you're ready, you can drop your hands and gently open your eyes. I feel like I just went to the spa for a couple minutes. <laughs> it's so sweet when we can connect there. I know some people have a hard time with self-love, but it's, you know, envisioning that we're caring for someone as we do so many other people you know, if we can hold space for ourselves as if we would for someone else and just be there with them mm. it can be very sweet. Everyone, boys, this one you're going to want to rewatch and re-listen to. Leah took us on an incredible overview of her new book, Overcoming Toxic Emotions, which I highly recommend. It is a not, it's not a long book at all, and it is packed full of useful tools, wisdom, in guiding principles to help you really work through not just this time, but time in the past and your life going forward. We talked about the AAA method and what that looks like and the distinction between blaming versus acknowledging and what a powerful distinction that is in terms of allowing us to reclaim personal power and free up some of the power that we give away to others and emotion. Speaking of emotion, we looked at how we can become addicted to emotions and why that is and how often we don't realize how much we gravitate towards the familiar. And if the familiar for us has been hurt and shame, we might inevitably find ourselves back in hurt and shame. Coming into looking at authentic self versus acceptable self and how much shame and the fear of rejection will play, play a part in our life and how we start to struggle and who we show up as and who we should be and what we can do to begin to separate that. And we concluded with the heart opening exercise. It's something so simple that we can do just to allow ourselves to connect and pour a little bit of self-love into ourselves. And like Leah said, sometimes it can be really hard for us to shower love onto ourselves when we give it so generously to others. But if we would be willing to extend ourselves that olive branch of generosity that we so often extend to others and generously heap a little bit of self-love onto self, it can go a tremendously long way to nurturing and healing. And lastly, before I formally thank you, Leah, I just wanted to acknowledge you too. Near the end of your book, and I may be miswording this, you had mentioned something that there was a twinge of, I think it was a twinge of, uh, of a twinge of something that there was a kind of a fear that would my, is my work enough and would the book make an impact? And I just wanted to acknowledge you and say that I think this book is extremely profound. It absolutely made an impact on me. I know it's going to make a tremendous impact on those who listen and watch this. And by that token, it certainly makes your work more than enough. It makes your work an invaluable gift to those who have allowed themselves to receive it today. And I wanna thank you for spending the time with us today. Thank you so much. That's very kind of you to say, I appreciate it. Absolutely. I'm more than happy to be here. Absolutely. We will see you next time, everyone, on another edition of A Handful of Hope. Bye-bye. <laughs>